episode of HR and Payroll 2.0. I'm Pete Tiliakis, and as always, I'm joined by the legendary Julie Fernandez. Welcome, Julie. Thanks, Pete. Let's give it a roll today. Yeah, absolutely. Happy Friday. Um, and we've got a guest this week. Uh, I'm really, really happy to, to invite to the show uh, and welcome to the show, I should say, uh, my good friend and uh, HR, I would say HR expert, all around HR expert, especially operations, HR operations and strategy. So uh, welcome, Kevin McDonald from EW Scripts Company. Pete, Julie, it's great being with you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, likewise. You know, we, we always catch up uh, at various events on the road and have some great conversations. And I thought it's, it'd be great to have you on and, and have you uh, tell your story about around transformation. I know you've been through a few iterations of that and really excited to uh, have you share that with our audience. Awesome. Yeah, good stuff. So look, maybe Kevin, you can start with telling us a little bit about your role at, at the EW Scripts company and a little bit about Scripts. I, I'm familiar and I know Julie is a little bit, but uh, we'd love to have you kind of maybe tell us about what your what your role is there. Because you've been there for a little while now. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm in my 16th year um, at Scripts now, uh, which uh, feels like uh, three or four different lifetimes with the uh, pace <laughs> of change um, at Scripts. But uh, a little bit about Scripts first, we're... Uh, 140 plus year old uh, media company started in uh, newspapers uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, back in the 1870s wow. uh, with the Penny Press. Um, EW Scripps uh, started that. It was the first paper that was really uh, uh, targeted at the um, you know the, the non rich basically. Um, yeah. And so <clears throat> that was a great start for our company. Um, we've been in just about every kind of media you can think of, um, you know, radio, TV, uh, cable, uh, cable networks, et cetera. And, you know, kind of where we find ourselves today after, you know, many transformations is uh, we own 61 TV stations in 41 markets. Uh, we have eight national networks uh, like ION, for example. Um, and we have a new script sports division that's really targeted targeted at getting uh, a sports right. So we just signed a deal with the WNBA. Oh, congrats. And, uh, you know, have some others in the works. So that's a, a brand new venture of ours um, that uh, I'm, I'm excited as a sports fan, but also as a, you know, obviously wanting our company to do well. Um, yeah. I'm excited kind of on both fronts there. Um, a lot of people probably know us from the Scripps National Spelling Bee, which actually just wrapped up in the uh, uh, end of May. Uh, we've been doing that for 90 years. So um, very entertaining uh, and very, uh, I think, uh, all inspiring when you see uh, some of oh. these uh, young kids do. So Yes. Uh, yeah. Very, very cool stuff. There. I always watch it and, and envy how badly they would kick my butt at a spelling, uh, a spelling <laughs> duel. I would, I would not. I'm, I, I grew up in the autocorrect generation, I think, you know, with, uh, with Microsoft. So yeah, I'm horrible at that. But shout out to the reigning champion. The spelling bee champion for 2023, Dev Shaw, who is from Largo, Florida. So I'm a Florida boy. So pr proud to see that. Uh, it's proud to see that. And I do watch every year um, again uh, in awe. And and you're right, it's incredible. I, I can't imagine the um, the the preparation that must go into that. Yeah, the, the kids are very impressive, and and uh, you yeah, know, getting to uh, you know hear their stories, you know, outside of just uh, spelling bee, I think is kind of what makes that. Uh, uh, in a broadcast so successful yeah. um, over the years. So it's great for your brand too, right? I mean, I don't know if uh, I think a lot of people that's the way that they understand the Scripps brand is by way of the spelling bee. So I'm not yeah, sure absolutely. everyone knows with the background of what Scripps does. So very cool. But look, I I, uh, I can relate. It's a, it's a dynamic um, industry. I, I I worked around radio and television with the Walt Disney Company uh, back when they owned ESPN Radio and Disney Radio and and Paul Harvey. I used to pay Paul Harvey, for example. Mm. Uh, and all those state great stations. Uh, now all that's been sold off, I think, uh, since then. And they, they've pushed that to different um, organizations that run radio purely. But um, yeah, it's very dynamic. And one, one of the things I'm really excited to talk to you about is just the evolution of the company, right? You guys seem to be very agile and you pivot uh, with, the, with the times, right? With the digital mo movement. And I think that, um, and I know about a lot of the HR part of that. So I'm, I'm excited to talk to you about that as we get, get a little further on uh, in the conversation. But we've got, we do have some news today. So I'd love to um, maybe hit on that a little bit. Um, Julie, I think you had one and I've got a couple of things I found out uh, this week too that I thought we could cover on. Yeah, I, I actually wanted to bring up one that was announced here uh, a couple of weeks back at the end of June. Uh, Mercer just announced they were selling off kind of their remaining benefits admin business to Bain. And I think we'll see that kind of take on a new life form as Aptia. 
<clears throat> is the name of the firm. And at first it was a little bit of a head scratcher because there were already, you know, previously health and benefits administration work that had been sold off to Morneau Chappelle. I think that was, I want to say around 2019. I don't remember exactly when that was. Um, and that's now become TELUS Health. So, you know, it just kind of left me thinking for the last few weeks, what was left? What was there left? And in particular, um, you know, there was definitely some stuff around the, the Mercer tech space um, that had been there for a while. Maybe Mercer Marketplace Exchange is probably one of the, you know, one of uh, the yes. things that people might really recognize or relate to. And uh, in doing some digging, you know, kind of the whole administrative organization around that, which serviced some DB and health and welfare clients was part of that spinoff. Some of them, those groups were, you know, uh, some of those clients actually went down market a little ways when you start talking about the exchanges and, and the DB activity. So not, not all large market clients that went down to the mid market and smaller market clients. They had some health and welfare presence in Iowa, you know, the exchanges I mentioned before and the retiree in the, in the active employee side and a lot of small market DB. I also um, know that the, uh, the UK pension admin piece was in there. That was significant and some India support and global. And I was a little surprised when I uh, learned that there was, you know, all in all, all of those, those, those bits and pieces were like 3000 people or so. So yeah. it was a little bit bigger than I thought when I first heard it. Um, and, uh, I, I do want to mention just since I live in the H HR HCM space so much that digital Mercer and the workday SI practice and some of that stuff is not really a part of it, but on the Ben admin side, you know, it looks like that kind of takes Mercer back to its consulting roots and, uh, Aptia will spin off under, uh, uh, and I'll never get the name right. Um, but some new leadership there who I'm sure is quite excited about the opportunity to, uh, be in a situation where there's uh, investment and excitement and 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 fresh eyes looking at them in the market. So yeah, yeah, I th I think this is the sort of thing where you know it sounds like they're they're taking away something they're not that focused on and giving it to someone who is, um, yeah. and that's always healthy for that for that product to grow. Um, so yeah, very cool. And and benefits is wow. It seems like it's um, I mean it's so important. Right. And the, and the term has a different meaning everywhere, especially in America versus outside. But I'm finding that this conversation, especially adjacent to payroll, where benefits is popping up more and more uh, as a key area that folks are looking to solve and maybe improve upon to, to be more competitive or to save costs or improve costs. So, um, yeah, I think you're going to see sure. more consolidation here because let's face it, there's not there's not it's not a super crowded market. Right. There's 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 plenty of options to get help, but it's not overly crowded. So I think we'll see more maybe getting together. Yeah. Lots of thoughts on that. I'm sure we can talk about later. What else did you scrape yeah. on Pete? For this yeah. Week? So uh, a couple of uh, pieces in the payroll and EOR world, um, Payslip, uh, my good friends at Payslip, one of my clients uh, just added a new reconciliation solution to their platform. It's something that will continuously monitor data in and out of the system in real time and detect uh, any issues and variances to surface those. So uh, kind of the the sort of thing that you're expecting now, with bi-directional interfaces between systems. Um, you're looking for that real time, you know, uh, proactive data quality, you know, tools. So very, very indicative of the stuff that Payslift uh, is building over there for, to uh, highly automate uh, the payroll process. Um, Globalization Partners, GP, as they are now known, expanded uh, GP Meridian, which we talked about uh, a few months ago, right? It's the, the, the replatforming of all of their uh, tech and services. So really bringing in just some, a couple of new enhancements around uh, digital, a new digital wallet capability that has a virtual debit card. Uh, not surprising, right? That's become uh, hugely popular connected to payments, uh, payment solutions being connected to payroll and EOR um, and more workflow and self-serve coming into that. And then of course, um, uh, the ability to actually amend contracts within GP Meridian. So if you know Globalization Partners well, one of the things they've they've been doing, I think over the years is, is increasingly creating more of an automated DIY experience around the EOR capabilities that they have with Meridian and really giving you the opportunity to come in, make, uh, it, make informed decisions with their data, uh, if to, to employ someone in a certain country, um, contract that and, and basically begin to onboard them, you know, very, very rapidly versus uh, a back and forth manual sort of effort, right? It's, it's very streamlined and automated. So um, yeah, so payroll and EOR, right? Continuing to get more and more uh, more tech, and I think we'll certainly see more coming over the coming months, and certainly into fall. I, I'm excited for what we're going to see in, in the second half of 
uh, you know, 2022 and then, or 23. And then of course, what, what'll be new coming into 24 with those H2 uh, releases. So lots of good stuff. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, All right. So let's jump back. back to I know. Kevin then. Let's get back to Kevin. Kevin, any thoughts on any of those things? Did any of those pique your interest as far as uh, what you're hearing there in, in the market or what you're dealing with in your work? Yeah. I mean, the, the big thing for me, I mean, I mean, I know um, AI is a, you know, big buzz um, now. And a lot of folks in my position are, you know, trying to figure out, you know, how, how to most uh, strategically use that, whether that's a, you know, an efficiency thing, is it really going to make us more productive, whatever, whatever that answer is going to be. But um, the, the other thing that I'm seeing and kind of what you were just talking about, Pete, a little bit is uh, around data. And I yeah. think uh, the, the vendors are really um, starting to position themselves for clients in terms of um, what data they can give you, which really puts an onus on us as clients um, to be able to take that data and actually do something with it and tell a story with it. Um, whether that's a you know an ROI, whether that's a um, value add to the organization beyond what may be obvious. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, <clears throat> it'll be real interesting to see how the skill sets in HR um, progress over the years um, to try to keep up with. Um, what the vendors are, you know, providing us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's going to be very tech. I think it's going to be very tech uh, intuitive, right? But also te- you're going to need to understand how that stuff works. And you're right, the AI, you know, we talk about it replacing people, but I really think it's going to be much more of an augmentation and an uplift to where, because you're going to have to have the emotional intelligence still looking at this data and this information. And you're, you're going to own that, right? As an organization, when it comes to AI, you can't just blindly trust um, these solutions, you got to know what they're doing and how they're using your information and, and have that practitioner view to be able, that lens to be able to put to that, I think is going to be really important. So it's going to be a different role for sure in the future. Uh, and I think the soft skills are going to be really, really, really important around that. Um, so look, I want to get into learning more about scripts, uh, and, and what you guys have been through, but I, I want to kind of ask you a, a, an easy question right up front, Kevin, how did, how did you get into HR and why have you stayed? We, we asked that, I love to ask that of payroll practitioners, but same thing goes for HR. What, what got you here and what keeps you around? Yeah. So I, I, I kind of lucked into HR. I tell people, uh, I, I started in the workforce right out of high school. Yeah. Uh, and was a non-traditional, you know, college student went at night and, you know, eventually finished my uh, degree uh, going in the evening after, you know, I'd been in the workforce for a little while and uh, been married, had a kid and, um, you know, all that stuff. And, uh, you know, eventually finished uh, the, the degree at night. So I was a, a non-traditional student. Um, but uh, my first job out of high school, I kind of lucked into the employee file room. Um, it was a obviously a very entry level position. Uh, but that's just where um, the, the bank that I went to work for, Fifth Third Bank here in Cincinnati, um, had an opening. So, uh, you know, didn't really know anything about human resources. Um, <laughs> some would argue I still don't, but uh, I definitely <laughs> didn't then. Um, yeah. But uh, started entering, you know, <laughs> entering new hires into the, you know, the, the payroll system, which actually was a uh, genesis um, back in those days. So oh, came, wow. I'm probably <laughs> every year. Um you know, and it, it, I, I did that for about a year and a half and uh, a position came open in the benefits department doing uh, 401k and, and uh, uh, enrollments and pension calcs and literally pension calcs by hand. Um, this is, you know, the days before, uh, you know, systems that uh, did, did, did that for you. So, uh, which was kind of interesting being the, you know, 19 or maybe early uh, or right around 20 year old uh, doing pension calcs. Um, but, uh, it certainly was an eye opening experience and, and gave me, a, uh, I think a little bit of a love for kind of the, the different things that you could do in HR. And so I started as opportunities came up, I just started, uh, bouncing to other areas and, you know, really, I think what kept me in HR was I have a, um, a kind of a love for problem solving Yeah, and, um, it, there's always something, always an issue to solve. Like one of my favorite early examples was uh, we hired a new benefits director. This is probably about four years into my career and uh, open enrollment came up and we had, you know, a couple thousand people in downtown Cincinnati and in the buildings that we had. And he and I spent a Sunday walking around the building, dropping off open enrollment packets oh my. on those desks. <laughs> and then we had to collect those open enrollment packets and hand key in all of the benefit elections. 
And he and I looked at each other and said, you know, why, Hey, why are we doing this? And B we're never doing this again. And he's yeah. and he basically said, <laughs> go figure out a way that we can never do this again. And so I, I actually uh, partnered with a, just a, a web development firm. They were not an HR specialty firm. They just designed websites for people and uh, partnered with them and they built us um, our first open enrollment website. And so I would kind of say the rest is history in terms of, you know, why I ended up staying because um, being able to um, take a problem, look for a solution. Um, in a lot of cases, that solution involved technology, as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, was something that really just uh, appealed to me. And so, um, yeah, 20 some odd years later, you know, here I am. Here you are still here. Well, we're thankful to have you. And and it's, you know, I really appreciate that you point out that non-traditional path because, I, I wish more young people did that today or had the opportunity to do that today, right? Maybe work for a little bit uh, and and understand what they want to do and where they fit in order to go off and then sort of finish their degree. So I love that you kind of did that in parallel. I did I did that as well. Uh, and I think it was really, really beneficial for me because I was able to, to hone in. So I, I love that you mentioned that too. But well, uh, yeah, and Pete, I would tell you that yeah. if I had gone to school, gone, gone to college right out of high school, I would yeah. have never, never gone to HR. Gone to HR, <laughs> <ever. Yeah. laughs> Sorry, I was finishing your statement there. No, thinking, okay. I probably would have done I, the same thing. <laughs> I, I, ironically, what I wanted to do, if you asked me in high school, was to be yeah. a, a sports reporter. Okay. So all these years later, now I'm at Scripps, but uh, yes, in, know, in a different right? capacity. Very cool. And benefits of all places at a very young age, young, yeah. ripe age of 19. So yes. Kevin, your, your story gives me a little bit of a throwback, especially as the 19 year old dealing with pensions and retirement, because I was probably knocking around my first job at the same time as you and ended up in a, a consulting organization that was building some of the earliest um, shared service centers. So our, our group was yeah. building the GM National Benefit Center. And my very first project right off the press was to do a Medicare verification audit. And, you know, the idea, the concept was around if, if the Medicare information is in a system, then, you know, Medicare pays first and the company pays second. And so just, you know, reaching out and, and capturing Medicare information from, um, from the retiree or over 65 or whatever the age was then, right, population. And I thought the same thing in my day, like, this is just ironic that I'm yeah. working so closely with a whole set of things that I really am not ready to be thinking about right now. Right. Yeah. Discomfort has a way of making us uh, in a very innovative, very fast, it really right? It does. Uh, so Kevin, tell us a little bit about the EW Scripps company, what the culture kind of what it's like in media operation or excuse me, media uh, operations, uh, HR as supporting that. Right. And you guys have get, again, been through a few pivots over the years, uh, rightfully so, right, with digital. But what's that? What's that like? Yeah. I, so, I mean, I'll I'll give you a, a, the kind of the uh, quick story. Um, and certainly, we can dive into any of these. But um, I, I joined uh, Scripps in two thousand seven, and in two thousand seven, we were um, a company. We had, I think, nine TV stations at that time, uh, thirteen newspapers. And we had, uh, I think it was five or six cable networks. So Food mm. Network, HGTV. Um, HGTV was actually started by a former um, CEO of ours. Oh, wow. uh, he was the CEO when I, when I, the CEO and the COO, when I joined the company, they were the ones who actually had the idea for HGTV. And it is a phenomenal story of, of listening to them back in, I think, you know, 1988 or something like that. Um, you know, talking to, you know, the old executives at the company and they're like, hold on, you, you're telling me people are going to watch people paint yeah. and TV and <laughs> or cook, sure right? enough, all these years later, one of the more yeah. popular uh, cable networks. But um, at that time uh, I came in to help lead the HR transformation effort. So um, scripts at that point was, uh, I think we had, you know, as an example, 43 FTE doing payroll. Oh, wow. For a company that was just around 10,000 employees. Um, uh, we we had 27 variations of a payroll cycle, oh, um, which goodness. I didn't even know you could have that many. And we <laughs> did. Um, and so um, we were as disparate as you could possibly get from a process standpoint. Uh, technology was borderline non-existent. Um, we had people soft, but it was just enough to get you paid and benefits. That's all we had rolled out. Yeah. And so um, I was... 
I, I came in to help lead our HR transformation, which was a couple of things to bring in a more technology and B to centralize and or source um, a lot of the back office operations uh, as it relates to HR. So, which I had uh, in my previous company, uh, we were one of the very early adopters of HR outsourcing. And so had some experience yeah. with that going in and uh, it was nice to be able to have a kind of an opportunity to go through it again, but with your, you know, knowing what you know now kind of uh, uh, approach. So um, at that point in 2007, we, and I apologize, my, uh, I oh, have no problem. We're dog friendly here. Uh, four legged yeah. co-workers that uh, you, you may be hearing from time to time, but at that it's point, all good, Kevin, this show is a hundred percent authentic. So you can swear, we can bark, uh, whatever. It doesn't matter. We do whatever we want. <laughs> they, they may be swearing. I don't know. It just depends on yeah. who's walking by. Okay. I just need to flag it as explicit on the show. That's all. When we upload. That's great. Oh my. <laughs> yeah. um, no worries. They're welcome. Four leg, four legs are welcome. It's all good. Yeah. Everyone's welcome. So uh, at, at the point I came in in 2007, uh, it was in February. In October of 2007, we announced that we were going to be splitting our company. So oh, we yes. were taking our cable networks and our um, we had a, a couple of websites, uh, like commercial websites, um, one over in the UK, actually, um, that we were going to spin off into a separate um, company. And we were going to keep TV and, and newspapers in uh, in a company by itself. So in the middle of our HR transformation <laughs> effort, we decided to split the company. Oh my goodness. Um, so yeah. it, that was just the first of a few examples like that, where, um, you know, Scripps has, uh, constantly is constantly trying to evolve with, um, the consumer, but also, you know, we say it a lot, Hey, we're a 140 uh, year old company. We want to be around for another hundred years. Right. So what is it going to take for us to, you know, to, to be around? And um, we've had very um, uh, uh, forward looking leadership, um, you know, and, and, and certainly in my time here, but certainly in our company's history as well. And uh, leadership that is not afraid to take a risk, leadership that is not afraid to um, be a, a leader uh, in the space and, and do what we think is right. And so from that standpoint, um, I would tell you that, you know, look, I, I don't come from a media background. Um, so some of it doesn't always, you know, make sense to me, you know, initially, because just because I don't have that level of understanding. But I would tell you from just an employee standpoint, first, uh, being an employee of the company and obviously vested in its in its success, um, it's encouraging to me that we're not just sitting still waiting for something to happen. We're, yeah. we're trying to get out ahead. And then, um, you know, look, we, we divested our newspapers in 2016 uh, or 2015. That was a massive step for our company um, to, to, to exit that space. You know, that's where we got our start all, you know, 100 plus years ago. Yeah. So, you know, we're not afraid to make those decisions and, and evolve with, um, you know, with what we think is going to, uh, you know, again, perpetuate us a hundred years from now. So yeah. it, it's very encouraging from an, uh, just being an employee from a standpoint of me as a, a, you know, a leader in the, in the HR space and HR operations. Um, it is a constant evolution of um, how we have to operate to support what the organization is doing. Yeah, And so change um, and adaptability, you know, from me and my team, those are probably two skills that I put very high on the list. Um, yeah, you, you got to know the payroll space. You got to know technology. You got to, you have to know all those things, but if, if you are not ready for change and if you're not adaptable, um, you, you're not going to be uh, very successful here. So yeah, um, I put those very high on the list of things that I look for in, in, in my people. Yeah. You know, you have a very unique uh, experience, Kevin. I mean, you, you've been in an organization that is highly agile, has remained highly agile. And at the same time, um, your HR has had to stay, keep pace with that, right. And, and be nimble with them. But you know, that, that's a, that you have to have, you need to write a book. you be honest. You need, to, <laughs> you need to write a book about all this, but that, I mean, a lot of people don't get to live it this way in terms of, you know, a lot of people don't stay at companies this long anymore, but also a lot of companies don't have that investment that you were just talking about, about their culture, wanting to really stay ahead of things. Um, so yeah, it's really fascinating. I think you're very fortunate in the, in, in the experience that you've had. What what about um, just the way in which HR has to be that that sort of nimble uh, you know a agility enabler right like how do you guys do it what what's been 
how do you keep up with with the Scripps organization moving the way it does and changing? And and we all know some of that is just the media industry. It's just the way it is. Uh, you have to be very fast, and you have to be very. Um, I, I think you do have to take some chances, especially nowadays. But but how do you guys manage it from the HR perspective? Like, what's what do you do? Is it is it? I mean, you mentioned change and communication, but how do you guys keep up? Yeah, I mean, for, from my standpoint, and and I actually uh, said this uh, at one of our HR leadership team meetings uh, recently. You know, we I, I kind of view us as an anecdote to chaos, right? Yeah. Um, when you're when you're going through um, the the amount of change that we go through, um, you know, and and other companies do as well. Certainly, that's not exclusive to Scripps. Um, but when you go through the amount of change and your employees are going through that change in terms of the way they do business or the way the company's doing business, uh, there are certain things that have to be consistent. There are mm -hmm. certain things that have that you have to continue to get right, even in the midst of all that change. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously near and dear to your heart payroll. Um, you know, I tell people all the time, um, I, I have a way for people to forget about all your initiatives you know, mess up their pay one time. Yeah, right. I, I guarantee they will forget about everything else until that's right. And yeah. so, uh, you know, we have to be consistent. So, you know, whether we're, you know, in our, during our deployment of Workday in 2018, while we had three acquisitions going on at the same time as we were implementing Workday at the same time yeah. as we were having to, you know, keep the lights on with our current solution, you know, there's no excuse. We have to get this done. We have to continue to get this right. There's nothing yeah. that's going to erode trust more than when some of those, um, you know, baseline services, um, you know, d don't work. Right. When you, when you come in the house and you flip the light switch, the lights better come on. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I think I, I have a team of people that truly believe that what we do matters, even though, you know, yeah, nobody knocks on your door and says, "Hey, thanks for getting my pay right." You know, this yeah. week. Hey, thanks for making sure you know my uh, you know United Healthcare knows I have coverage this week. You know, nobody does that, um, but that's the consistency that's required um, because again, there's so much other change going on. So, um, you know, I, I think from an HR standpoint, that that operational excellence um, and that focus on you know what i would call the kind of the bottom of the hierarchy of needs right uh, which is you know people's pay and benefits that's their security hey, Kevin, yeah I, so i'd love to ask you a couple of tactical strategies or just items you know to know whether they've fallen under your purview or on your radar um there are things that i hear oftentimes from organizations that either need to be agile or trying to be agile and one of those is you know do, owning or uh, or having some direct reporting relationship to um, a, a PMO or change management for the organization. And you just mm -hmm. made me wonder if, if um, that has been a part of HR at Scripps um, now or over the years, or uh, if that might be an element of secret sauce. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so we've done uh, almost 30 different uh, transactions uh, in my time here, whether that's, uh, you know, acquisitions, mergers, divestitures, um, with three of those being what I would call, you know, transformative in nature, very, very large changes. Um, you know, the, the deal we did in 2015 with Journal um, was industry analysts said this was the most complex transaction they've ever seen. So, um you know, in, in our industry. So we, we've gone through some stuff and, and we've gotten really good at it. One of the things that I brought to the table, you know, when I joined uh, the third bank uh, and my previous employer, we, we had gone through 30 plus acquisitions as well. And I was a member uh, from the HR capacity. I was a member of that acquisition team. And so as Scripps started to do those type of transactional activities, um, that's something I could bring to the table, some some experience with that. So, um, you know, we have had um, when I when I first joined the company, change and um, you know change management was kind of done within each group. Mm -hmm. Or in the case of like larger projects, you might partner with a consulting firm to to kind of bring some of that expertise. Um, over the years, we have actually brought in. Uh, and, and we have now on our corporate communications team, uh, change management um, skills. So we partner with them 
uh, both from a communications and change management perspective, very closely. I mean, I, I, I just consider them part of HR. Right, I mean, right. yes, I know they report their corp comm, but you know, they're just part of the team. So, um, and we've worked really, really well together, but I would say the other thing and the other tactic that, that, um, uh, we, we've done from the very beginning is HR, you know, my, my group kind of, uh, within HR, IT and finance and accounting are tied to the hip. And there's way too much overlap in terms of what we do and our impact that we can have on each other um, in terms of, you know, whether it's something, the way something's coded in a system that's going to affect the downstream in interface, you know, whatever it is, um, there's way too much overlap in what we do for us to not be on the same page. So, um, very early on in any type of projects, um, the first thing we do is get together. Like, okay, what do you need? What do you need? What do you need? Let's make sure we're all marching to the same, to the same beat. And that, um, you know, I'm not going to flip a switch that's going to negatively impact you upstream or downstream. So I, I would say, you know, just having that type of working relationship um, with some of your key partners internally is another way that you, you can avoid disaster. Do, do you guys use a, a sort of a, a, a center of expertise for your change then, Kevin? Uh, we do. Um, yeah. and, and, and it's in our, in our uh, corporate communications group. So, yeah. I mean, you, you, you have people, you know, like myself, but you have other people, whether it be in HR or IT, we've been through so much change. We yeah. know what it takes. You're good at it. <laughs> yeah. So, so that coupled yeah. with, um, the, the center of expertise that we have, um, you know, I think we've, from a transactional um, kind of change perspective, we, we mm -hmm. do really well. Yeah, that's phenomenal. Most organizations are not good at that and many overlook that. Yeah. So you've been through a couple of iterations of HR transformation. I know I was, I was very privileged. Uh, Kevin, you were one of the first buyers I really studied early in my career as an analyst. Remember, we, we did an interview together uh, mm -hmm. that we recorded in, in, um, uh, in Cincinnati. It was a great, great day. I enjoyed that. Uh, and you've been through these iterations, right? And I think in some ways, uh, each time you've sort of leveled up, right? I mean, what, what would be your maybe tips for being successful in, in, in this continual change environment? And what advice would you maybe have for, uh, for other leaders that are, that are getting into a transformative project? Oh, I, I, I you know, I, I, <laughs> I cannot say emphatically enough, embrace it. Yeah absolutely embrace it. There, there's nothing. Um, it, look, look, Pete, you've got to have a sense of adventure, right? I mean, yeah. like full stop. Like if, if you don't have that, you're probably not going to be long for the job because it's just going to exhaust you. Right. Um, given that I, I would say embrace the change in, in, in two ways. One, it's going to, the, the things that you can bring to the table beyond what your job description says that you do. Yeah. Right. One of the things I love about scripts and, and, and the opportunity does, opportunities I've had here is as people have seen me do certain things, they realize, oh, he's good at that. Let's use him here. And, uh, you know, an example is when, uh, you know, in a deal we had with a uh, where we outsourced some finance and accounting work, uh, back office finance and accounting work um, overseas that that deal was not going well. It was not going as intended. And they asked me to come in and, you know, kind of help with, with mediation of that. And now I know nothing about finance and accounting. That's not my, that's not my area. I've never, you know, never sat in that area and done, done any um, real work, but it wasn't about knowing finance and accounting. It was about understanding why this deal, why this change didn't go well. Yeah. And so, you know, that was an, that was an opportunity for me to, flex some different muscles and, and also learn, um, uh, you know, and, and, and gain some trust in the organization. So the next thing that came up was, Hey, we really need a solution around our sales compensation. It's, it's, it's kind of done all throughout the company. Uh, we, we want to centralize that and have a little more, uh, a, a little more better control over that. Right. Is that a project you can, you can help lead. So as, as you show additional value that you can bring to the table, there's going to be more opportunities for you. So, so that's one reason to, uh, to embrace it. And the, and the second reason to embrace it is if you truly have um, a, a constant, you know, uh, a desire to learn, um, 
then there's nothing better than going through change. You'll learn so much about yourself. Oh, you'll yeah. learn something about your, you know, your team, your colleagues. You'll meet people that you may have otherwise never met and, and the stuff that you can learn from them. I mean, you, you want to talk about writing a book. I could write a book on the stuff that I've learned from other people yeah. um, and, 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 and the impact that that's had on me. And if you're humble enough to actually say, you know what, I am going to learn from everybody that I meet. I'm going to try to learn something. Um, it, it's, it's such an enriching thing not just in my professional life, but in my personal life as well. Yeah. I use, um, you know, in the, in the things I'm involved with beyond, you know, work, I use the lessons that I've learned in my professional life as much there as I do at work. Yeah. That's outstanding. Yeah. You know, you mentioned earlier about, uh, M and a, right. I mean, I was thinking along the lines of my experience, like, those are often the most complicated and sometimes painful things to go through, right? They're normally shotgunned in and, and mm -hmm. no one knew about them sometimes, you know, it sounds like you guys communicate really well in your organization. So I applaud you on that. I think that's a big part of your success. It sounds, but like sometimes those things aren't entirely communicated well. Uh, and it's just this, it's just this sort of nightmare situation sometimes that, as you're doing it, but you come out of it like, wow, it's like a boot camp. A merger mm -hmm. and acquisition in HR is like a boot camp, and you end up learning. I did more from that one project than I did probably on any other project any other time. And it was well worth the, you know, the pain of it all, but, and very gratifying at the other side of it, right. To see what comes out of it. And it, and it's so uh, it's so important that HR gets that right. There's that's such a big piece of merger, you know, mergers uh, happening. So I think yeah. the same can be said for some of these really big transformations, whether, you know, like organizations yeah. that haven't gone to the cloud yet that are doing that, but embracing and understand that operating model change needs to happen, that that um, the interaction model and even the channels of access to HR information are, are different and they just fundamentally change. And I find myself in with uh, practitioner projects right now, just giving that same message, Kevin, only maybe I'm not always sharing, sharing the from the best perspective, like embrace the change because going through a large transformation gives you skills that are extremely yes. important in the market. And, and so, you know, nobody, you don't want to necessarily encourage people to go someplace else with those skills, but, but those skills teach you about what you need to constantly evolve your organization and to help it be more agile at the core uh, because a broader base of employees really gets, you know, engaged and excited and enthusiastic about, you know, about taking their destiny, right? And and making HR into the next best thing. Yeah, Julie, I, I, I could not agree more. I, I think, you know, yeah, obviously, you know, for those people, look, you never know what's going to happen. Somebody could come in and buy your company and, yeah. and you could be out of a job. So making yourself more marketable, there's absolutely nothing um, wrong with that and, and, and something that people should, you know, even if you're not actively looking, making yourself more marketable. But I, I would say the, the, the word I would throw in there is making yourself more confident, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, the, the more you do these things and the more you put yourself in situations where you're not comfortable, you know, I tell, I tell the kids I coach all the time, get comfortable being uncomfortable, yes. not just because it's going to make you better at basketball, but it's going to make you better at life. Because oh yeah. Life, you know, uh, it was, um, uh, Carol Lawson, who's the, uh, the, the, the Duke coach, um, you know, she said, look, it, it's not about avoiding hard. It's making hard easier. Yeah. Like you're, you're going to go through hard stuff. Yeah. We want to make it easier. You're not going to avoid going through hard stuff. So I, I think every time you put yourself in that situation of going through, you know, a merge and acquisition P to your point, or Julie, any type of transformational change, um, you're going to be better at it each time and you're going to grow, just grow your own personal confidence that'll give you that confidence to take, you know, Hey, Kevin, we want you to take a more active role this next time. Okay, great. I have the confidence to do that. And I think, you know, the, the ability to deal with change and be comfortable with change um, in today's world, I, I can't think of a, a, of a more needed skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and all of those all of those uh, sort of soft skills are going to be so key, you know, as practitioners, right? Not just knowing compliance, not just knowing how the tech works, but being able to bring that emotional intelligence and that creativity and um, you know leadership to the to the table is going to be super important. And that's you're right. When you go through these things, that's how you grow and learn them. Uh, well, and and. The most painful ones are the ones you learn the most from, you know. There, there's no question. You know, you you learn from failure. You know, I. I 
I, I gave a, a little bit of a end of season speech a couple of years ago to, to my team and, and, and the, the parents are in the room as well. And, you know, one of the things I told them was you should crave adversity. Yeah. You should cr <laughs> almost crave opportunities to fail because that's where you're going to learn the most. The most growth is going to come from those opportunities and, and, and going through those experiences. And it, it's OK. Right. Um, you know, yeah, there are certain things you don't want to get wrong. You know, like we talked about earlier in our business. Yeah. You want to make sure you got, you know, 6,000 people every two weeks relying on that pay to go into their accounts. You better get that right. Um, but you can't, you can't let that, um, you know, fear, um, keep you from doing other things that again, will help you stretch those muscles. I mean, it's like, if you yeah. never work out, you're never going to, you know, it, your muscle never going to change, and, <laughs> you know, eventually wither. Right. So you, you, these are, you know, I, I think the other thing people don't realize is like, these are disposable skills. These are things that will go away if you don't, if you don't use them. So, um, it, to, to me, I, I, I encourage that not only with the people I'm around, but you know, the, the people that I, uh, you know, the people on my team, the people that, that I work with, you know, honestly, it's, it's, it's given me going through that stuff has given me the confidence to, to join, you know, nonprofit boards and things like yeah. that as well. Right. Because I know, while I don't necessarily, uh, may know, not know anything about, um, you know, parts of it, I know I can help because right. I know these things. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so it's, um, you know, it's just opened so many doors for me. So that's great. I, yeah, Julie, that's great. your point is so well taken. Yeah. How, how about um, the technology perspective, Kevin? You know, obviously I, I happen to know you guys have been through a couple of iterations of leveling up your, your HCM technology uh, as an organization, but how, how important has that been to, to enabling your culture and enabling your success as far as an organization an HR organization supporting your, uh, you know, bigger business? Yeah. So, you know, look, I, I think technology takes a couple different, um, you know, a couple different tracks, right? There's part of it that is that idea that, you know, that I talked about earlier, that when I come in the door and flip the light switch on, the, the lights better come on, yeah. right? There yep. are parts of, of the technology. Is it dependable? Is it reliable? Is it available to me? And, you know, whether I'm sitting at my desk or on my phone or like, there's just certain things that I just consider table stakes, um, and so making sure that we're keeping up from that standpoint and, and that we're always providing or, or working with vendors who help provide um, that experience is, is very important. That kind of the other track with technology is, you know, I've said for years, you know, look, good talent management could be done on, you know, a napkin, right? Like yeah. you don't need, you don't have to have technology, but what can, what, how can we use technology to make it easier? Yeah. to make it more accessible, to make, make it more inclusive so that everyone has the opportunity. Right. And it's not yep. just, well, Pete knows Kevin. So that's why Kevin got the opportunity. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so how, how can we use technology to make sure that, you know, we're truly looking across all 6,000 of our employees to, to utilize and, you know, the highest and best use of, of, you know, all the skills that we have internally. So there are opportunities there from a technology standpoint to, to make sure uh, that, that we're being good stewards of the company's resources, which, you know, in my case are the human resources, right? So I think, you know, from that standpoint, um, you know, it, it's, it's been, it's been a lot about partnering with our other centers of excellence to make yeah. sure um, that, that we're bringing the right solution um, to bear while we're also still laser focused on making sure that that baseline is always there, that the data is reliable. I mean, Pete and Julie, I can tell you that I've had, you know, uh, it's been about three years now since we created a position that is um, uh, director of analytics or our senior director of, of HCM uh, analytics. So our, our human capital metrics and, it's been so refreshing over the years. Like the, the, you know, you used to have the conversations about you would bring data to a leader or bring data to a, you know, an HR leadership team meeting or something like that. Yeah. And you would have a lot of conversations about the data itself and whether it was, well, right. is that really accurate? Mm -hmm. Is that really? And now we're no, we're no longer having those conversations. That's the great. Data's That's good. great. Now we're having the, the conversations of, okay, what is the data telling me and what should we do about it? And it's yep. so refreshing to have, um, you know, to have those conversations because people trust that, you know, That's a yes, great this point. is a consistent and, and, and the data's quality. So, 
from that standpoint, um, I think technology, uh, you know, is certainly an enabler of that. Um, but it's not, I, I would say it's not everything. Right? Yes. Yeah. Hey, Kevin, for folks that feel like they never get to that part, right. And, and there's an mm -hmm. awful lot of HR leaders who, you know, do these changes over and over again. They just feel like they never get there. Um, it, how long did you know how long would you say that took because i if, i feel like folks get disheartened you know that they're just never going to get to the point where people stop questioning the data <laughs> yeah well i so uh, let me say this first there are cases and and i think you have to recognize this as the person you know bring the data into the room there are cases where i'm going to bring data to pete and Pete doesn't like what the data is telling him he should do about it. And so Pete's going to question the data, not because Pete really believes the data is wrong. It's just, he doesn't like where it's going. Right. Yeah. So he's yeah. going to use that as a crutch. Yeah. And so there, there are absolutely times where that happens and, and you need to be able to, to kind of recognize that, you know, one of the things that I tell people all the time, including me, I usually come to, um, you know, whether it's a meeting or, or just a, a, just an issue or whatever, I, I come with a point of view and, and my team would tell you, I come with a fairly strong point of view, but I think they would also tell you, and, and sometimes I do that just to get a point of view on the table that we can start beating up, right. Yeah. Versus just starting with a whiteboard, you right. know, a blank whiteboard. But I think my team would also tell you that if you show me something that disputes what I think and it's data, I'm humble enough to say I was completely wrong. Right. And unfortunately some people aren't. So, so there's going to be that side of things. Mm -hmm. And, and it's really important to recognize that because I, I battled that, you know, in, in the past. The other thing that I would say though, is you as the practitioner really need to take a hard look at what, at your, at your data practices, right? Look, I also realize, you know, I remember doing a, uh, this is kind of the far extreme example but I remember doing a, a a session at a conference one time, and I can't even remember what the what the topic of the session was necessarily. But um, a, a lady approached me afterwards, and she said uh, it, it was something along the lines of like transformation. And she approached me and said, um, "You know, I know we need to start this, but I I just don't know where to start." And I have 114 ERPs. Oh, wow. Because of all the acquisitions that they had done and they had oh, not, my. um, they had not standardized anything. They had not done any consolidation. <laughs> and if you run into that situation, I have really bad news for you. You're never going to not have the, is the data right? Conversation. No, you need to solve yeah. that like, problem, yeah. right? There's just no getting past that. Right. Yeah. So yeah. you, you do at some point, you do have to take some ownership of, um, are our data practices good enough? And I'll give you another example of, of this. When, when I came into um, Scripps, we had uh, 5,000 job codes for 10,000 employees. Oh, my. Right. I mean, that's nearly impossible, <laughs> right? yeah. but we did. And we also had the situation where, Pete, you and I were in the same job code, but in the system, it says that I was non-exempt and you were exempt. Mm. Well, the reason that can happen is because there was nothing downstream that was reliant on that data. Right. Right. And so, for example, when we put in a timekeeping system and it was like, well, guess what? We can't have that situation anymore. Right. Cause I need one of you to fill out a timesheet and I need one of you not to fill out a timesheet. So, you know, one of you has got to be non-exempt. One of you has got to be exempt. And so, um, you know, you, you start to have, um, that type of inheritance and that rules based uh, approach to your data where I'm sorry, if you're in this job code, you are going to share these attributes. Yeah. Like we're, we're not, we're no longer going to make independent decisions about some of this data. If you're in this job code, you get these things and here's what it means downstream. The more you can do that type of rules based inheritance, the more right. consistent your data is going to be and the more reliable your data is going to be. And you're yeah. going to stop having those conversations. It, it really is everybody's responsibility, right? It's not just HR. Um, Absolutely. Right. We need everybody in, on board with that. So, you know, Kevin, earlier we talked about, um, you talked about AI a little bit, but like how, how prevalent is it in your organization from an HR perspective? And what is your, what, what, what is Scripps viewpoint on that moving forward from a roadmap standpoint? What's kind of maybe what's next for you for HR if it's not AI? Yeah, I, I don't want to say I'm, you know, skeptical about it. I, I, I'm i still trying to figure out what the right area is for, for AI to really help us. Yeah, We have been dabbling in it for a few years now with um, 
uh, basically with, uh, you know, a, a virtual assistant uh, that you can use via, you know, a widget on your computer or, or yeah. you know, you can actually SMS text it, you know, with your, just your phone um, and, and get answers to basic questions. You know, um, we've actually opened it up um, where you can actually, um, it, it does some interaction with Workday through APIs. And so I can, you know, tell it, hey, I want to take next Friday off and it'll actually initiate that process for me behind the scenes. So, you know, we've dabbled in it and in it, in, in it some in some areas there in terms of, you know, AI like chat GPT, uh, while I think it's extraordinarily cool and I've used it in some areas of my personal life, I'm and, and, and even professionally, I think I asked it the other day, um, you know, a question about, um, you know, the interaction between uh, HR business partners and managers. And it actually gave me a, a very well thought out answer. I mean, so yeah. that, that's really <laughs> impressive. I'm not sure. So I think it's great for things like that. I'm not sure yet exactly how to start using that in kind of in mass um, in our HR business processes. Um, do I think there's absolutely, you know, some, some areas for sure. Um, but it's, you know, Pete, as you know, uh, you know, we always kind of, you know, the, the corporate functions always kind of lag behind the consumer. Um, oh, yeah. So, you know, they're going to work out some kinks there. We're going to figure out how to make sure that while, yes, it's a powerful tool, we can't just, I, I can't just open that up and say, hey, chat GPT, yes. you know, respond to this employee relations case for me. Yeah, right? yeah. No, <laughs> so agreed. like we have to figure out how to kind of right size that for what we're doing from a, you know, from an HR standpoint. Yeah. I do love the aug augmentative capabilities there. And I think that uh, you're right. It, I think it's in the need, it needs to be a, a crawl, walk, run sort of thing, right? And you have to be able to, I believe, uh, looking at use case by use case and understand what it's solving and how it's working and, and how it's going to complement your, you know, what you're, what you have in place as it is. And is it right for that, for that, you know, environment? So yeah, it's good stuff. What, what's on the roadmap for, for scripts uh, from an HR perspective in the coming, coming year? What are you, what are you guys focused on? Yeah. So we are uh, at the, at the moment, um, scripts is going through a, a, a pretty big reorganization uh, where we've, uh, named a uh, chief operating officer. So all the, oh, very the business functions are, are reporting up through um, her now. And, uh, you know, still some kind of trickle down effect of, of, of that type of organizational change. And um, uh, we've recently announced um, uh, our, our big news initiative where we're kind of rethinking the way um, that we deliver news in the local markets. And yeah. so um, a, a lot of change uh, from a business standpoint. Uh, and HR is obviously you know, reacting to that and, and, and yep. playing our part that, that with that change. Um, I think from a, uh, you know, what, what we're doing kind of outside of that is really just still trying to focus on um, talent development and uh, making sure that uh, our employees are having the opportunity again to, to, uh, to have their skills showcased and, and uh, you know, uh, kind of be included in, in those, uh, opportunities that that come out of this uh, reorganization and this uh, you know shake up in ter in terms of news. So yeah. um, it, it's it, again it's about enabling those things for the business. Uh, we're doing some work on the employee engagement side as well that I'm really excited about um, as well. So um, cool. yeah, I've got a, got a lot on the plate and um, a, a lot a lot of good stuff that I think is um, you know truly value add um, beyond just, again, getting the fundamentals and the blocking and tackling right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, congratulations on all that success. I, I, I think you guys are a great uh, example of how I think organizations should be thinking about these things. And, um, you know, you're always, you're, you're a very agile group and you're always pivoting your organization. And I think your HR obviously has a lot, uh, a lot to, you know, to pat themselves on the back for helping enable. So congratulations to, uh, to you guys. Well, I appreciate um, that beat. Thank you. Yeah, yes, sir. And thank you for coming on. I, you know, I always, I always love uh, us connecting on the road and getting together and having some conversations. So I knew it would be great to have you on here. So thank you again for, for coming on. Um, we always wrap up, Kevin, by, uh, you know, just giving some insights as to where we can connect. Um, I know you do some, I'd love to hear about also, we didn't talk a little bit about your coaching work in basketball and some of your nonprofit work. Uh, where, where can everyone connect with you and where, where maybe can we uh, find some of your work outside that you might yeah, absolutely. Promote? So, yeah. uh, you know, best way would be uh, LinkedIn. Um, so you can okay. find me on LinkedIn and then ha happy to connect there. I get uh, chat requests all the time and um, usually end up just saying, hey, here, here's an email or my phone number, you know, uh, kind of reach out to me that way. But yeah, um, that's a great way. Um, 
you know, just some other stuff that I'm in, involved in. You mentioned coaching basketball at our uh, local high school here. I'm going into my 12th year uh, doing that and absolutely love it. And Congrats. love the parallel between, um, you know, coaching and my professional life and, and really just yeah. um, being able to impact um, kids. And, and I've had a very supportive uh, team here at Scripps that um, has not just allowed me to do it, but really um, pushed me into it. And, you know, we, uh, you know, that that's also kind of led into some nonprofit yeah. work. So uh, one of my favorites um, is the uh, Talbert House uh, Fatherhood Committee. So I, I grew up, okay. I grew up without a father. Um, and so the, the Talbert House Fatherhood Committee is, is really devoted to um, helping fathers um, reenter their kids' lives, whether it's been, you know, jail, uh, drug addiction, uh, w- whatever it is, uh, but really helping them both from a legal standpoint, but also from a, a skill standpoint, um, become better fathers. So something very near and dear to That's my heart. That's outstanding. There. Yeah, I love um, that. How do we find them? What's their What's their website? I'll, uh, I'll be Talbert sure. House, sure. Talbert House um, uh, is the organization um, okay. here in Cincinnati, and uh, it, it's the fatherhood. They they Talbert House does a, a, a broad range of things, but the father committee is the, uh, what I serve on. And then, um, yeah. the other nonprofit that's, um, a, a little more localized here in, in Fairfield, the town I live in is the uh, purple monkey project, which was, purple um, project. started okay. after, um, the loss of a, a good friend of mine, his 10 uh, year old daughter back in May of t- t- 2021 oh my. and, um, to, to an accident and her favorite stuffed animal was a purple monkey. So they named it after that. And, you know, we are doing some really good things in the community and just, she was a serial spreader of joy. Uh, awesome. that's kind of what she was known for. And so we're continuing to do that by giving kids scholarships and, you know, partnering with, um, some of the athletic programs and, and awarding, um, you know, scholarships to, to, to seniors, uh, partnering with other organizations. Um, so, uh, that, that are kind of youth centered, um, like we are paying off school fees, um, doing, doing some, just some really good stuff in the community. So that's uh purple monkey project.org for anybody that wants more information about that. But yeah. those, those are things that I, I really love doing. It's, it, they've allowed me to use my skills to actually, you know, impact, um, them in, in a positive way, those organizations, but there, there's nothing more, um, uh, th- there's nothing better for the soul than, than, uh, um, yeah. you know, I, I'll, I'll use the, uh, scripts, uh, motto. We do well by doing good. And, Absolutely. and, and I think that's, uh, I've tried to live up to that in my personal life as well. Yeah. Outstanding. I'll, I'll be sure to share those in the description, your LinkedIn, as well as the, uh, the, both organizations, the Talbot house and the purple monkey project. So thank you for, for what you do. Those are, those are great things. And where are you going to be on the road, Kevin? Are you going to be, uh, any events this fall? Uh, workday rising is a maybe for me. Um, okay. I, I haven't decided if I, if I'm going to go get, uh, again, but, uh, possibly there and, uh, yeah. kind of, we'll see, uh, from there. How about HR tech? You're going to be at HR tech possibly? Uh, TBD. TBD. All right. Well, yes, sir. well, let's look for each other. We always connect and I always love our conversations on the road. So Absolutely. thank you for, uh, for doing that. Julie, what, uh, what do you got going oh, on? Let's see. As you know, Pete, I'm deep in client <laughs> work, especially in the summer. Um, and, yep. uh, just enjoying the heck out of that. I will, uh, be probably back in Houston, Texas area in the middle of August. So if there's anybody who might want to take advantage of that, that'd be great. And uh, I am actually getting prepared now for the SSOW conference, the Shared Services and Outsourcing yes. Week. It is a conference that tends to be more for practitioners than for uh, providers. And that's what folks really like about it. Um, companies that are deep into you know, a journey uh, and they're trying to get to shared services for the first time or actually very mature in that journey and looking at global shared services um, uh, tend to participate there. And I'm doing a talk track this year that I think should be really fun um, on um, the trials and tribulations, failures even along the HR transformation journey. And I think it fits perfectly with what Kevin has described over and over again as part of his career, which is you learn the most. And, and in hindsight, you know, oftentimes you enjoy the most, you know, your professional journey um, when you're, uh, you're going through some of the more complicated things and you're, you know, in your professional life. And, um, so, uh, I, I, I think I'll be able to welcome as many as three folks to a panel and actively looking Very right cool. now to finalize my panel of, uh, practitioners and folks that have taken some interesting journeys and would love to share them with peers. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, all right. Well, good, good stuff. It sounds like you got a lot going on, Julie. Uh, I myself as well have a lot. Uh, <laughs> you can find my newest blog on Safeguard Global's uh, chat SG is available now at uh, gxtadvisors.com. 
uh, and that highlights what they're doing with generative AI across their platform. Um, I have a new report out with Payslip. Uh, Payslip, the GPMI, well, payroll org, I should say, uh, and GXT, me, uh, have worked together on a global payroll report that is out that you can access. You can see the, um, you can find the link to that. I'll actually put it in my, um, I'll put it in the, the, the description here, but you can find it on my LinkedIn. Um, and of course, uh, Daily Pay's uh, panel is coming up. I'm doing a, a panel on Monday, the 24th at uh, 12 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be doing a panel discussion with a couple of uh, a CFO, a COO, uh, an HR director, and we have a VP or an a, a, a executive from Visa with back-end data on spend trends to, to round out some of these um, you know, responsible usage uh, points of view that we're going to be talking about. And then on the 26th, I will be at the uh, South City Kitchen in Buckhead. So if you are, uh, I'm doing that with the Magellan team. Uh, Magellan AI is doing a mixer for multinational firms here in the Atlanta area that are HR and business leaders, you know, seeking to understand uh, some of the dynamics around uh, global employment. And so myself and a few vendors and uh, the team Magellan will be there. Uh, that's at, again, 6 p.m. July 26th at South City Kitchen in Buckhead. If you want to go, just reach out and I'll get you uh, connected to that. So look, it's been a great, great conversation, Kevin. Thank you again for joining us. And Julie, as always, great to uh, great to see and hear from you again on, on this fine Friday. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me, Pete. Yeah, take care, everyone. Bye.